Welcome to Dark Knight Films Reviews. I'm your host, Matt Spies, and today we're doing another ranking video. This time we are ranking all eight of the Universal Frankenstein films. So we will be ranking all eight films from worst to the best. Where would you rank these films? Let me know in the comments down below. How would you rank these eight films? And, as usual, if you like these videos that I've been doing like this, please like, share, and subscribe, and I'll sure continue doing them. I'm enjoying this. <laughs> so, let's start with number eight. House of Dracula, 1945. Now this one, it is it is John Carradine as as Dracula in here, and uh, he's uh, barely in it. It's, it's supposed to be his movie, but he's replaced with a uh, pseudo replacement in Onslow Stevens. But we do get plenty of the Frankenstein monster in here as Glenn Strange is playing him. And I've always really liked Glenn Strange's performance as uh, the uh, monster. He always reminds me of the later versions of um, Boris Karloff. So he, and he really does look the part, I mean, he, he fits that mold. He really does look really good in there. But unfortunately, this film does not give him uh, much to do except to lay around and then, you know, at the end he breaks free and, and goes on a little bit of a rampage, as usual. Um, but Glenn Strange was really good as, as the Frankenstein monster. Um, this one didn't have much else other than that, other than, you know, uh, having, you know, Larry Talbot become a full-on hero and redeem him uh, for Lon Chaney. Of course, they would completely undo that in uh, one of these later films, which uh, I'll get to in a few moments. Coming in at number seven, we have House of Frankenstein from 1944. This one, again, you have Glenn Strange playing the monster, and he gives a good performance, as always, in here, but he's just not given too much to do other than lay on a slab, and then eventually, you know, by when the film uh, calls for him to do something, you know, get off the slab and go on a bit of a warpath at the end. Um, but... And otherwise, you know, I mean, it's got Larry Talbot's Wolfman and John Carradine's Dracula in there. But uh, those two in this film take a back seat to uh, Boris Karloff, who returned uh, playing a uh, doctor character in there. Uh, we want to see him play the Frankenstein monster. And I know he was getting a little older here, so he couldn't just play that character. But... Um, yeah, it's just weird watching a Frankenstein movie that features Boris Karloff and having him playing another character instead of playing the monster himself. Coming in at number six, we have Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein from 1948. This is the film I was talking about that uh, completely shit-canned the entire uh, redemption of Larry Talbot, of him finally being cured of his lycanthropy, and uh, now he's all of a sudden, he's becoming a werewolf again, he's becoming the wolf man again, um, and again, Glenn Strange is playing the monster in this, um, and it's really cool to get to see him acting alongside a great like Bela Lugosi as Dracula in here, but as I said in my Dracula um, review and everything on on this same film, I mean, 
they are played serious, which I, I respect that. But in doing so, it just makes you want more from the film. Um, having Abbott and Costello's humor saddled on to this great dramatic performances by these horror legends is bittersweet because this was the end to the Universal Monsters in this film. Coming in at number five is Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman from 1943. Um, this one, it just disappoints me because you have Bela Lugosi finally taking on the role of the monster. He was originally supposed to have played the monster in Frankenstein in 1931, but for whatever reason... It didn't work out. He turned it down, apparently. And I think it was because he wasn't able to speak any dialogue. And yet here we are. Frankenstein meets the Wolfman. And he's playing the monster. And all he's doing is growling. He growls in this as much as the freaking Wolfman growls. Larry Talbot, I mean, Lon Chaney Jr. is Larry Talbot is... The standout in this, as he always was in any of the films. In the, it's just a shame that Universal disrespected this character, the character of Larry Talbot, the Wolfman, by only giving him one solo film. The rest of his time, he was always guest starring in other films in the, in the Universal series. Um... And that, that's a shame, because the character deserved better than this. But, on to Bela Lugosi. It is just weird. The previous movie, Bela Lugosi's Igor had his brain transplanted into the monster's body, and he was talking with Bela Lugosi's voice. This one, he is played by Bela Lugosi, and he doesn't talk. He just, rawr, rawr, you know, <sighs> what the hell were they thinking? The final fight was pretty good, though, between the monster and the wolfman. The monster really manhandles the wolfman and throws him around quite a bit in there. He's defiant. He doesn't give up very easily, and he's constantly jumping on him and knocking him back. And so it, it's a pretty good little final fight, though. But uh, it's a wasted potential of having Bela finally playing the monster and not living up to what was set up from the previous film. Coming in at number four, we have The Ghost of Frankenstein from 1942. This is the film that I was just talking about before, where Bela Lugosi is playing Igor for the second time in the series, and he's dying. He gets fatally wounded. And he's dying, and he wants to, you know, transfer his, you know, brain into the monster. Which he does. And when the monster, you know, and the monster is played by Lon Chaney Jr. And his, uh, technically his only performance as the character, but he did stand in for Glenn Strange in Evan and Costello meet Frankenstein as well, for one scene, because uh, Glenn Strange ended up twisting his ankle and couldn't do it. He, he was injured, so he couldn't do this shot. So uh, um, Lon Chaney Jr. stepped in, got into the suit, did the stunt for him. But he's not a bad um, Frankenstein monster, hence the reason why I put him uh, high on this list. And like I said, the the ending was the perfect ending to where when Frankenstein's monster wakes up with Igor's brain, he starts talking with Bela Lugosi's voice, 
Yes, it's weird seeing Bela Lugosi's voice coming out of uh, Lon Chaney Jr., but they had the perfect setup for the next film by casting Bela as Frankenstein's monster, and they didn't even have him talking, you know, with the Igor voice. So, uh, missed potential. It was a great ending, though. It was a really great ending. Um, too bad they screwed it up in the next film. Coming in at number three, we have Son of Frankenstein from 1939. Now, this film stars the great Basil Rothbone. And he is so cool as um, Dr. Frankenstein's son, who's taking over. He has tried to distance himself from his father's works, but it finally is just too much for him. And uh, and, and he has Igor uh, Bela Lugosi in here in his first portrayal of this character. Bela is so good at playing this character with the weird voice that he does with the character. Um, and that's what made him so good in this one and so good in the next one. But um, having those two together is one thing. But then whenever you have um, Boris Karloff uh, reprising his role as the Frankenstein monster for the third and final time... It is just an iconic moment to have Basil Rathbone, Bela Lugosi, and Boris Karloff all in one film. And then, of course, you have the coup de grace of this film. The standout in this film is Lionel Atwill as the inspector with the uh, wooden hand, you know, that's always, you know, lifts it up so that he can shake your hand and then... He lowers it down and everything. I mean, this character, Lionel Atwill, was one of the great actors of the of the 40s and 50s. I mean, he was so good at these kinds of roles. And he was great as the inspector here. So, I love uh, Son of Frankenstein. It's, it's a very good... But I love uh, the monster... Uh, Boris Karloff's look in this one with the uh, the fur um, outfit, and, and he has a certain... He looks a little meatier in this one than he was in the others. The others, he's more a little more thin-based, and in this one, he just looks a little meatier and bigger and just bulkier and looks scarier in this one. And he is scarier in this one because this is the most intimidating the monster ever was when uh, Boris was playing him. So... That's my number three. Coming in at number two, we have Frankenstein from 1931. This one stars Colin Clive as Dr. Frankenstein, Edward Van Sloan as his mentor in here. You have Dwight Fry as Fritz. And then, of course, you have Boris Karloff in his first portrayal of the Frankenstein monster. This film, it is, in my opinion, this film is a much more interesting film to watch, um, looking back on it today, than Dracula at the same, which was shot around the same time, because uh, James Whale directs this film with a lot more atmosphere and a lot more style than what Todd Browning directed Dracula. Um, there, there are still moments where the camera is kind of just static and set for shots, but he just puts more style into this thing than what Todd Browning did in Dracula. And, and and the humor that he puts in it in certain spots is, is really great as well. So that's why it makes my number two. And coming in at number one, we have The Bride of Frankenstein from 1935. Now this film brings back the two survivors of the uh, previous 
film with uh, Colin Clive and, well, Boris Karloff's monster didn't really survive, but, you know, at the beginning of this film, it's explained that he did survive. Um, so, it is a good continuation. James Whale ups his directing from Frankenstein into this one. Um, you have Elsa Lanchester playing both Mary Shelley and the female monster that um, Boris Karloff's, his monster, wants Dr. Frankenstein to make for him. Because um, he wants a, uh, a love interest like Dr. Frankenstein has. And then, of course, you have Ernest Thessinger as Dr. Pretorius, which he stands out really well in this, and he does such a good job playing this role. He is sort of a dark and sinister kind of a character who's not fully above board, and he's doing everything for his own sinister reasons in helping Dr. Frankenstein in this. But... uh by the end, thankfully, uh, Dr. Frankenstein finally becomes the hero that he should be. It's, it's funny, because uh, the, the female monster, when the monster actually is ready to put an end to both of them, you know, for, to everything, with the whole, we belong dead, and, you know. Um, I love it when, when the... Uh, the Bride of Frankenstein ends up doing the whole hiss, which makes him kind of hesitate about doing it, you know. So, it is the best of the Universal Frankenstein movies by far. Um, one of the very few uh, sequels that I fully agree was better than the original. So, what do you think? What is your listing ranking the eight Universal Frankenstein movies. Do you agree with my list? Leave your comments down below and let me know what you think. And if you like this video, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, because it really does help the channel out a lot. And, as I said, this is still October, this is still the Halloween season, and we still have more to come. So, stick around. I'll see you next time.